So welcome to the latest episode of the flagship podcast on the Celtics Are Here channel. I am Quinny. I'm now captain in the ship. Declan is uh, he's off the life raft and he's got back to got back to dry land. And uh, we may be turning this into a pirate ship or something. But the latest uh, <laughs> latest co-pilot I've got joining me today is um, the one, the only Ryan McGinley. Ryan, mm-hmm. thanks a lot for joining us, mate. Great to meet you. Thanks for having me, mate. I'm glad to be on. I'm glad to be on this this pirate ship, as you called it. Um, I'm <laughs> delighted to to get going on adventures, mate. So thanks for having me. Aye, absolutely buzzing for it. And uh, you know, we're, I was just saying before coming on, I've, I've, I watch a lot of Celtic fan media myself, and you know, I'm not on this one. And uh, you know, long watching and long listening to podcasts and shows you get you, you're involved in. So again, similar to Declan, I feel like I know you before I do a show <laughs> with you. So that's always nice, you know. So I, I'm I'm really looking forward to it, buddy. Um. And yeah, like I think a lot of Celtic fans, Ryan, coming to this point of the week, we're all saying the same thing. Thank God international football is all done. But for as far as being a Celtic fan, particularly a Scottish Celtic fan, there's probably never been a better end to an international window than the one we've just had. You know, Scotland beating Spain at Hamden, kind of against all the odds, I suppose. But what a result. Yeah, absolutely. It was one of those games that I was like... As long as we give a good account of ourselves, then I'll be quite happy. If we can get a draw, that'd be absolutely brilliant. But to come away with a 2 nothing win, absolutely buzzing with that. I looked at their team before the game started. I was like, this team could be got at. They don't have the household names that they had even five, six years ago, I would say. So looking at that, I was like, we've got, we've got a slight chance if everything goes into favour with us. And I mean, that happened 2 nothing. It, it could have been more as well, which was absolutely brilliant. But... Six points out of six. Um, it's, it's a good time to be a Scotland fan just now. Well, for sure. And there's more Scotland fans now than ever, probably, after that result. Um, <laughs> so that's great to see. But yeah, it was a, you know, it was definitely not the, the A-list or Spain squad that we're expected to see. Now, if you, you know, for, for anyone from a distance, the Spain team is pretty strong. You know, there's nothing to discredit our result or anything. You know, as, as you say, Ryan, it's a bit of a generational change. Um, but, you know, guys like Rodri, Mourinho, Oya Razabal, these guys are in best 11 Spain, you know, so it's a good team for sure. And the boys, uh, you know, that um, did not look out of place at all. You know, Tierney looked brilliant despite the lack of minutes he's had. Robbo, McGinn, even Christie. Christie looked like a bit of Maeda, you know, he was running about mm. all over the place, causing all sorts of havoc. You know, it was a, it was a great performance. Um, it wasn't one of those jammy ones, but it's like you get mm. a flicky set piece go your way or something like that. We actually bossed them. So it was great to yeah. watch. And I'd, Good fun watching the, the, the yeah. Celtic I think we just, I think with Christie as well. I think we've seen what he could have been under Ange Postecoglou for about five games before he left. Um, eighteen, sort of eighteen, twenty months ago, we've always seen that he can be that sort of workhorse. We know that he gives one hundred and ten percent effort every time. But it's, it's good to see him sort of replicating that for Scotland. He's been a bit of a linchpin for Scotland. You look, you think of his goal against Serbia a couple of years ago as well. He's uh, he's, yep. he's doing a good job for Steve Clark. Yeah, for sure. So it was one of those results where like the Scotland team now is like, you know, like I'm looking at, at it now. See Porteous obviously just recently of Hibbs, Tierney, obviously we know Robertson originally at Dundee United, McGinn, Hibbs, Christie, and Verness, you know, Dykes broke through, was it Livingston, wasn't it? You know, so like this team, you know, has got like a decent kind of SPFL kind of footprint in it. It's not just kind of bordered into, you know, Celtic and Rangers or even like like we've had before, I know we've got McTominay, but when you've had the likes of Fletcher or whatever guys that have came from like English academies, um, you know, so there's a lot of there's a, there's a lot of kind of local victories in this team. Aaron Hickey as well, Hearts Academy until very recently, you know, going to Italy and whatever. So um, it's got a nice flavour of the Scotland team about it. though now, you know, it's but definitely not the best. You know, we could probably use in our striker, um, but it's a it's, it's it's a great squad to to follow think- and enjoy. I think Cal McGregor would agree with that with the better striker as well. He should have got an assist at the end of the game if Lawrence Shankland had his shooting bits on. I, I maintain that if, if that was Dykes, Dykes would have scored or Shea Adams. Um, but that's just my opinion. Yeah, I know for sure. And, you know, that long bus and running the 96th minute, every Celtic fan got off their couch you know, and shouted, we never stop. <laughs> <laughs> it's, he, he's bringing he, he's bringing Ange Ball into continental sort of focus. It was absolutely brilliant. Um it's just Cal McGregor. That's that's just what he does, and it's great to see other people noticing in that that as well. That's our captain doing that against what, the three-time European champions. It's what what a level we'd be doing that. But we're not surprised because we know how good a player he is. 
No, completely. And, uh, you know, we did have some other players um, go out on international duty. We had some international kind of headlines at the beginning of the window, Ryan, as, as you'll remember, like Taylor. You know, like, so the thing that came out from the club, from Ange, with the whole Taylor thing, was we give the nations the data and it's up to them what they do. So Taylor never went anywhere near Lesser Hamden or whatever, but Moy flew, flies to Australia, Maeda flies to Japan, and then they're then having, it feels like what they've done is they've seen the in real life what was on paper, and they went, okay, it's legit. They're a bit overworked. They could do with a break, and I think sent them home. Um, so it feels like, for the most part, like the squad wasn't really too stretched over this international period. Taksibanovic made two starts for Montenegro in centre midfield in a big game against Serbia. He played about 70-odd minutes in the first match. It wasn't a great opponent. We only played the first half. I forget who it was. Um, and, yeah, Ralston gets into the Scotland squad and then comes back out. And, you know, this international break has been a bit weird with the players that weren't called up and then the ones that kind of were, but then ultimately didn't feature. So I don't think we're really coming out of it too heavily taxed, are we? No, I don't think so. I think I think the one worry before the international break was Hitati. Obviously, he never got called up, so that didn't really matter with regards to Japan. But even even just seeing these players go away and then come back, at least they're not playing football. At least if, if they are injured, then it's only a slight injury because they wouldn't be called up if it was, if it was a really, really bad injury. So sure. I think we should we should, we should be okay. Um, you see guys like Carter Vickers um, training in the in the training videos over the past couple of days. So not not too much to worry about with Ralston. We've got we've got Johnson. Johnson's the first pick anyway. So it's it's just a worry on, on whether or not he's jet lagged because I know he's been playing games as well. But I think we're in a pretty good place. We've got a lot of players that stayed behind. They they'll have got some beneficial training, and yeah, we're in a good place. I would say. Yeah, definitely. I actually forgot all about Arthur Johnson, but I know the Ballon d'Or campaign has started for him now. Oh, absolutely. From the Canada fans. So, um, yeah, they played on the 29th, which at point of recording is yesterday. Uh, a 4 1 win over Honduras in Canada. Um, so, hopefully, he's back in Glasgow kind of newish. Um, <laughs> so, today being Thursday. So, yeah, so let's see. But, yeah, I think he'll be fine. He's a workhorse. And uh, how did he get on? He played right centre back. So, he wasn't long busting up oh. the wing or anything. Um, I do. And ton- yeah. So, yeah, quite a dominant performance uh, from Canada. So, yeah, hopefully he's not too exerted. I think he'll be fine. Yeah, good shout. I forgot all about him. Uh, and, yeah, Car- Car- Vickers was a really strange one for me because, like, you know, I, f- I think America could really use him. But, hey-ho, their loss is our gain in that respect. Absolutely. But pro- probably the, the one player that's made a lot of headlines throughout the international break um, – on the field and off the field, if you like, is Leo Labada. Goes away with Israel, was in and out of the squad. I don't think he ultimately featured, but also there's a whole contract situation and the transfer speculation that's coming out around him. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, it was it was a bit weird. I think he got injured as well and he came back to Scotland. I don't know if he got injured during a training session or something like that in the final training session before his game. Yeah, it's a weird one. The contract situation, obviously, he's got a long-term contract. Um, I think he signed what a five-year deal last season, so he's still got another, what, three and a half years to go on that. Yeah. But we've seen this before. We've seen this with Yakimakis and with Juranovic. And if um, if past sort of stories or, or examples are to go by, I think we'll see him go in the summer. I think he will go. I, I think the, the way he's been talking, the, way, the fact that he's got... I think he's got Juranovic's agent now as well, who was quite influential in getting him... And getting him a move. What I would say is, I, I think it'd be far too early for him to move. I would personally, if I was him, I would be staying at Celtic and getting some game time because, as it stands at the moment, he's not an automatic first pick in the team. So he'd be really taking a massive gamble going somewhere, especially down south, if that's where he's talking about. I mean, you look at his international teammate, Mano Solomon, he's just breaking into the Fulham team. And that's what been what six, seven months since he joined Fulham. He's been in and out of the team. Yep. I don't think Abad is as good a player as Mana Solomon at this point, so it'd be a massive risk for him, and I think if he's got smart people around him, he'd be staying put for a, another couple of years and make himself a, a better player than what he is just now. Not as to say he's a bad player, he's a, he is a really good young player, but there's still a lot of development to go in his game before he becomes the player that we all think he can be. No, I totally agree, and I think there's like some good parallels to draw probably between a lot of the chat we've had from the Scotland team. If you listen to all the players post-match and the manager, it's all about oh, this squad all now has 30, 40, 50 caps. That was all the kind of chat. When you look at the Celtic squad for how high the ceiling is and how talented we think they all are, Ryan, they only have like five or six Champions League appearances, European outings to their name each, you know, and um, you know they're prob- they are still quite green be- 
green behind the gills, if that's the way you say that, um, on that elite level. You know, we're seeing mm -hmm. that domestically, you know, but I think that's probably why, like, you know, I would expect anyway some of these players to be quite keen on next season and having a proper go at, you know, make, making a name for themselves on, on the top level. And I totally agree with you. I think it probably is a wee bit too soon for, like, Abada can't go to England and become a starter, but no. it could... He could definitely go and do what he's doing for us for Sunday in England, get the last 10, 20 minutes of a match and influence the outcome. Or he could maybe go to the continent and try his hand. But again, I think I think you're right to bring up the Jack Marcus and the Juranovic um, comparable because as much as we love Abada and as much as we love Juranovic and Jack Marcus, we know they weren't the Ange acquisitions. You know, they were club acquisitions and connections and all that kind of stuff, you know, so... Um, as much as again as he probably loves him, if people are going to come in and give us good money, and then he thinks he can turn around and go and buy another four Tomoki Awatas and Rio Hatates, then he's probably going to go and do that. I mean, you look at the fact that um, Abada was what was that his first sort of proper signing? I know we had Liam Shaw and Urigidi, but Liam Shaw was coming in, and I'm sure Urigidi was as well. I'm sure that he was sort of looked out before and even came in. Abada was a do do that hand signing. You've yeah. got to remember that was his agent when he was bringing. Yes, he was the jewel in the Israeli league at that time. His numbers were incredible for a nineteen-year-old, but he was sort of like a club signing as well when you look at it. Um, so it might. It's a, it's a weird one because you know he's been contributing this season, but I don't like I don't like the the murmurings that are coming out with regards to his contract or the rejection of a contract. Look, he's got every right to reject a contract, but. You want these players to be staying put unless they're desperate to leave, and you don't want a player to be desperate to leave. You want them to be focused going into the second half of the, or the or the latter, latter portions of the season. Um, so I just hope it gets resolved one way or another, and it doesn't go go on and on and, and disrupt the season. But we've, that's the thing with the wingers that we've got. We've got plenty of reinforcements if if there was to be a fallout or something, which I don't think there will be. But I don't think he'll be starting every game either, so he's not going to be the happiest sort of player. No, totally. And just thinking about it now going into the summer, like we do expect Celtic to almost always in a summer window make one big outgoing probably to maybe fund any other business that'll happen. And, you know, like other than Abada, I can't really think of too many other players in the squad that is like, let's say, a prime asset for the market. You know, like, like Abada's numbers are through the roof. And then when you marry that with his age, he is like, uh, you know, Moneyball Football Scouts dream at the moment, you know, pick him up from a couple at Celtic with the goals per minute, assists per minute, you know, that he carries. So I think he's like quite similar to Juranovic in terms of when we were talking about him pre-World Cup, it was like, oh, he's in his late 20s. We've got a long contract. This is the kind of time if you're going to do it, maybe similar to Jackie Marcus. And Abad is, like you say, I think he's very much in that same um, space, but kind of the other end of the spectrum where it's like, people will pay a lot of money for a 19, 20 year old with these numbers you know, um, versus it's a 28 year old and this is our last chance to get money for them, Yeah. so I think the club do need to kind of, because again like if clubs are putting this amount of interest into them we might have a bad uh, I say, like, cause I, say I, I don't think anyone's rushing them out the door I think we all love them, and for the most part like, you know, he's a, he's a good part of the team um, but if uh, you know, like if, if, if he's got this much interest already Let's wind forward and let's say we have a European campaign and let's say he's managed to get himself a, quite an important goal or make an important contribution into a big match, then those offers are not going to go anywhere, you know, from his perspective. You know, he's not going to lose out on opportunity by hanging about at Celtic at this point as long as he keeps doing what he's doing, you know. So it definitely does become then, um, are you going to focus on your, your development or are you going to take the first chance, you know, kind of thing. Yeah. So it'll be interesting to see how that develops for sure. It's a sticker twi twist sort of scenario. Whether I, I mean, we've had this in the past. You look at maybe even three, four years ago in Cham's value, and then that that plummeted because we let his contract run down. Um, I remember what, what was it? Porto were bidding fourteen million, fourteen million million, and maybe I heard a rumor about Chancel and Bemba. Maybe that's wishful thinking, but that was a certain half at the time. But um, we let that, we kept him, and then the value depreciated. So it's just a, it's it's all about taking that risk or not taking that risk. Um, but I'm sure we've got guys in there that know what they're doing with regards to valuations and stuff. So I, I trust them to get the best for you regardless. If, yeah, if he totally. has to go, if, if he stays, he stays. But if he goes, I'm sure we can replace him. 
Yeah, completely. Because like you say, he's not even breaking into the first 11. So if we're getting this amount of interest for a bench player, then that's uh, it's, not a bad, it's not a bad spot to be in, you know. Uh, so it, it bodes well because all over the pitch, we're, we're, we're two to a position, you know, very comfortably and, and very, very good quality. And, you know, we're coming into this final chapter of the season now. Abada didn't feature for Israel. I just went and double checked that. And like you said, the and I think the first training session they had, he pulled out and then it was a bit questionable. And then I think ultimately it was one of those, I'm going to go back to Glasgow now um, <laughs> kind, of, kind of decisions that was taken. So um, moving into this kind of final chapter of the season, we've obviously got the last couple of games before we get to the split. We then get the split and we've got the semi-final and, and everything else that's going on. Like I'm saying, the competition for places we've got all across the pitch. There's a lot of guys we're talking about here, Ryan, and some of them are maybe, maybe carrying a wee niggling or a knock or something. Mm. But it feels like all of them are putting their Celtic first team spot over taking any chances over, and like I say, like Molly going away to Australia or Abada going to Israel. If there's any doubt, they're like, listen, I need to get back here and I need to be fit to get into this team at the weekend mm. because I've got, you know, my career in front of me and all the rest of it, whatever was going on. So, um, is it, is it, in terms of the squad competition, like losing somebody like Abada, I don't think it even would make much of a difference to the competitive mm. element in the team, you know. So, in terms of losing Abada, I don't think he would sizingly, you know, change the team. Whereas if it was somebody like perhaps I've seen some links today, I think it's clickbait. I think it's just a lot of nonsense. But there's been some links floating around for Hitate to Brighton. I don't know if you've caught any mm. of that. Yeah, um, yeah, the thought of that. Sickens me to be honest. Um, the thought of even <laughs> the thought of even Hatati moving anywhere sickens me. Um, easily my favourite player under this in this Ange team. He's uh, an absolute joy to watch. I I could see him going to Brighton with that. I, you watch Matoma doing absolute bits over there. Um, he's probably going to get a bigger move himself. But I think Hatati's better than Brighton, and I, I feel bad in saying that because Brighton are doing so well this season. But I think his ceiling's so much higher than Brighton. And if he was to go to Brighton, I think he'd be there for what a season max, and then he'd be getting the big, the big box in terms of offers. I think we need to stay put with this guy. He's so, I think you see, you seen in the last game against Hibs how much we struggled when he came off the pitch. He, yep. uh, as much as Cal McGregor's such an important part of that midfield, I think Katati is just as important because he's the metronome. He keeps everyone ticking in the team, and he's also great at, um, at, at distributing the ball and getting forward as well. I'm, I'm just a massive, massive fan of Katati's. He's one of the reasons why you go to the football. I think he's, he just entertains you. Yeah, I, I'm a huge, you know huge fans of the uh, Hitati over here for sure. And like, yeah, no, I make you quite right. Like, I think you'd be quite clearly like the skills you see him present on a bigger pitch with the, with the facilities and all the rest of it that goes around that elite level. I think he would take to it probably like a duck to water. But mm -hmm. the the form we've seen out of Hitati that makes me you know speak so highly of him and you as well. Like, I don't think he's really had that form for too long in a Celtic jersey in terms of like that kind of level he's at in midfield now, you know. So mm -hmm. it is one of those ones where I would hope he doesn't, again, similar to what we're saying about Abada, just take the first offer that comes along and thinks he goes for it. Because mm -hmm. somebody like him, like, and I don't mind saying this, like, if, if, if he can prove he can do what he does for us at the moment at a higher level, hopefully wearing green and white hoops is where he proves it before I move. But he's a player that could easily walk into any of these high situation midfields like a Liverpool or any of the, any top six team you look down there. They could all use a player like him that's so nippy, can get on the ball and can get in the half spaces and play, you know, those line breaking passes for quick attackers to break on. Because that's how the whole game is played at the elite level is one two touch stuff and playing a ball in between um, for, for other players to get on. So. Uh, I've got ultimate faith he'll do, he'll do amazing as well. And yeah, I ho yeah. hopefully, I think the Brighton one now, Brian, see, because of the success of Matoma and, you know, other guys have had over, like Alexis McAllister and a few other guys have spotted. Hopefully, if the, the Brighton interest is genuine, hopefully that is like, um, from a Celtic selfish perspective, if we were to lose and we want to maximise fee, obviously. So hopefully that's a bit of a signal that other teams are like, oh, okay, well, if they're looking at them, then, you know, we'll go and look at them as well now kind of thing, because... They don't want to go pay 80 million to Brighton. You know, what's that guy Cassiedo getting um linked for to, to Chelsea? Never that's, that's 50, 50, you know? It's just 70 million. It was 70 million yeah. he was getting linked to Arsenal. Um I think that would be an interesting one if the wheels were to go in motion. I know it, it could be clickbait that that rumour, but if Moises Caicedo was to go from Brighton for 70, 80 million, you could see Hitati as being his replacement. I mean, it's not we can't be naive here. We've got he, he will be looking at the Premier League. So that, you want to play at the highest level that you can. I mean, as much as I absolutely love him, he would stroll it down there. 
I think he, I yeah. think he would just do the same down there as he done up here. But I'm not wishing him away because I'm enjoying every minute of him playing in green and white at the moment. That's it. Long may it continue. You know, we've got long contracts and all these guys. And again, yeah. like very similar with Hitati. Like it's maybe one of the things that I don't think he's had as much interest in him in general until this little clickbaity rumour. And I do think it is the fact that, you know, when you look at his track record, the amount of senior appearances is small, you know, so he still, I think, has a, a bit to prove. And I think he's, I think, you know, Matoma is one of these guys, they're probably pals. They come through the same team, they're the same age group, yeah. you know. So him seeing Matoma and the Prem banging worldies, you know, that's just fire under his belly to show up at the weekend for us and, and really show it, and especially getting snubbed by Japan. So um, on top mm. of that, so... I think this could be a really exciting period for Itate. I hope it is just clickbait and he just stays true to the course in terms of charge on and, and keep progressing. That's the thing. Um, Hitate, what age is he? 25, I think he is. 24, 25. Yep. Um, I think he's around about that age. I mean, you look at... I'm, I'm just making a comparison with another Premier League midfielder. Look at Yuri Telemans. He's been playing since he was 16. He Hitate is a young 25 compared to Telemans, so he's not got a lot of mileage on his body. That'll be quite attractive for um, teams down south or whatever, but um, True. I'm not wishing him away, and I don't want people to be no. saying that I'm wishing him away. I'm no. desperate for him to stay as long as we can. He's so important <laughs> to the team, but we might we might even have his replacement in Awata in the team, and we've not even seen too much of him yet. So it's all about that continuity, but I'm, I'm very happy with the way the squad is at the moment with regards to that. Well, with some of these moving parts we've got the now, Ryan, like we've mentioned a couple of times, you know, like Moy, Hitate, I think he's got a hamstring injury. I don't think he'll be playing at the weekend. Um, mm. Maybe we see Iwata get a start this weekend, I you know, so. by all accounts. I heard somebody reference earlier that one of the Celtic coaches describes Iwata as the best one yet in terms My of training coach. application. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, could we maybe get a wee sniff of Iwata at the weekend? I Oscar, hope so. We could be a good game for it. That could be a great game for him. I think that would really, really suit him. Every time he's came on the park, I've been impressed. There's, he's just got something. He's an absolute... He's like Hatati, but if Hatati ate Hatati, he's, like, he's bigger than him. Um, <laughs> he's, he's so... He brings authority to the team. I think he's the missing link, what we've needed for years, that defensive midfielder. that Because we all wanted Soro to succeed. Soro didn't have the head to play as a defensive midfielder. He was too rash. This guy looks as if he's measured and absolutely everything he does. And I'm really, really excited to see more and more of him. I think next season's going to be massive for him. I think he'll be starting every European game as that number six. And it'll just, we'll play him and McGregor as a double pivot. It'll be, that. that's what I want. I want us to have that sort of protection in the midfield when we go into Europe next season. And he could be the guy to get, give us that. Yeah, it's been very impressive in the little minutes he's had. And like you say, like even with those 10, five, six minutes he's been picking up, like, he does have a presence on the pitch. You know, he does fit into the system. You mentioned the Hibs game earlier on. For me, the big problem with the Hibs game was Turnbull and O'Reilly became a shadow of one another. They were yeah. everywhere together. And that Awata just never falls into that trap, even if it is with McGregor. You know, if it's two guys deeper, they never get on top of each other. And even though Awata is seen as like the holder, you know, let's say he's played five games for Celtic. I'm pretty sure in three or four of them, I've seen him get counterattacks for his going. He's been on the edge mm-hmm. of the box playing final third passes and stuff, you know, so... Um, he's definitely very comfortable in the system, of course, as we know, because he's came from the previous club of the manager. And yeah, man, like that, that's something I never really thought about before coming onto the podcast. But we could see a, a we could see a, a start for a Wata the weekend. See, just as a parallel, I remember ten years ago, 10, 11, 12 years ago, I think when when Yama was brought into the team. Now, when Yama was on the bench for a lot for the first five, six, seven games, then there was a point that. You couldn't not have him on the bench. You had to start. I think that'll be the same with Iwata. Once you get him in this team, he'll stay there. I don't, I don't think he's going to be moving out once he gets in. He's just waiting on that opportune moment to come in and show us what he can do. Yeah, that's it. It's such an exciting thought because as I'm thinking ahead to the weekend, like McGregor's played two international games for Scotland, right? But it's both been at Hamden. He's barely, he's not even left his house, right? So it's mm-hmm. not like he's, he's been flying around the world or anything. It's been a normal week for him. He's had two games, quite a normal situation for him, you know? Um, Moy, as we know, Hitate, as we spoke about, but then outside of that, put Awata on the pitch. We've then got Turnbull, we've then got O'Reilly, you know. So, how would how would we think about the midfield for Ross County? I would think, you know, O'Reilly is probably on to start it. Good form coming into the break, and then with Moy being questionable. But if Awata mm-hmm. does start, then there's maybe a casualty there. Yeah, I mean, Moy, Moy was injured, so I don't, I don't know if maybe he might be on the bench. Um, Cal McGregor's always going to start. He's going to start every game. He's a captain. That's just what he does. I'd love to see Iwata in the team. Um, with regards to it, it's, it's a weird one because Turnbull 
doesn't really play as the number 10. I know we don't really have a number 10, but the furthest forward midfielder, he never really plays that. It's more Hitati's role that he plays. Agreed. Turn, Turnbull, get, Turnbull get two assists in the last game, <laughs> didn't he? Was it two or three? Um, I think it was two, which is absolutely mental because I didn't think he had his best game until Matt O'Reilly came off the park. But, I mean, the stats don't lie. He got two assists. He, he was involved in the goals. So... Can you can you drop him? But at the same time, I think we're a better team when Turnbull isn't on the pitch, unfortunately. So if it was me, I would pick O'Reilly, but I could see why Turnbull would keep keep his place if that was the case. But you've got to you've got to accommodate Turnbull, I think, in the team. You've got yeah. you can't have you can't have the one paced players next to him. Like Moy. Moy and Turnbull doesn't work. We've seen that at St. Martin earlier on in the season. Um O'Reilly and Turnbull doesn't necessarily work either. You need to have runners around him. Um, for it to work because he hasn't, he doesn't have a lot of pace to begin with. Um, but yeah, if it was me, it'd be O'Reilly, um, Awat, and McGregor. Sounds like a quality midfield mm-hmm. for sure. And that, like Ross County, like it's, it's one of these games where going away up there, there's there's always a story to be had uh, going up to Dingwall for these games. We've had some funny results and some uh, important goals scored over uh, over the years. But I say there's nine games to go. The next two games are against Ross County, and then we've also got a, a Rangers match after that. And that'll probably give us a bit of an indication, as we've got the notes here for the final part of the season, how, you know, it, it, you know let's say we pick up six points over that period there. Are we, are we going to say job done, Ryan? If we get six points out of the next two games, we've won the league, I think. I mean, you look at, it would, it would take a monumental collapse, and that wouldn't happen. A monumental collapse for us would be dropping points in one game at this point in time. That's yeah. the that, that's the difference now. We used to have collapse where we'd go two, three games. Like you remember the COVID season that we had defeats and then draws. And we didn't have any sort of form whatsoever. A bad form for us is dropping points in one game now. The standards have in, have increased. They've been heightened since Andrews came in. He's forced them up the way. So I I, I don't I don't think I don't think there will be a collapse. We win we win our next two games. Two games that I would expect us to win especially if we're at home against Rangers, we should be dominating every team that we play against at home unless we're in the, the Champions League, in my opinion. So if we win our next two games, I think we've won the league and then we can focus on the treble. Yeah, it's party time for sure, you know. And, uh, you know, there's been a bit of a spat between the clubs in preparation for, you know, the last game between us before the split, you know, uh, to do the ticket allocation, you know, uh, stuff going into the, I think it's, I think it's, you know, it's, I think, it's went both ways now, but basically Celtic had approached Rangers and asked for the full stand to come back down to safety concerns over the fans being stuffed into that little corner under their big giant telly that it looks like it was something from the, you know, it just looks totally out of place now, doesn't it? But, mm-hmm. uh, but anyway, they, they refuted and Celtic ultimately said, we don't want any tickets in if you're going to play that. And Rangers have kind of just responded in kind, just being a bit petulant about it and going, well, we don't want any of your tickets either, you know, kind of thing. So, um, they, they, I think the game we've got at the 8th, there, there, won't, there won't be any Rangers fans in it. So, I've been at one or two, uh, I've been at a lot of old firms, but I've been at one or two old firms in particular where there's not been that much of the away uh, element there. And especially if there's no away fans there, Ryan, like, see those Rangers players, like, it's that they're just going to get bullied for, like, 90 minutes off the fans. You know, every miss, it's just going to be like you're going to see them crumble big time, you know, because mm-hmm. it'll, it's it's like it's the whole thing that started this is the away section at our end at Ibrox just ripping the Mickey out of them when just we're all over them, dominating the game, dominating the pitch, and you know football players like you in those instances you could see the confidence getting sucked out of them into the stands. Um, so yeah, like you say, we should be dominating teams at home, but never mind when they're not going to bring any away support and we're going to sell the thing out. <laughs> you know, it's um. Yeah. It's going to be 13 on 11. Yeah, that's that. Um, especially when they, I think their team relies on passion merchants like Tavernier and Ryan Jack. Um, absolute perennial losers, in my opinion, you could say. Um, it, it wouldn't surprise me if they had something to do with the, the, t- the tickets being taken off us because those, those sort of players have been synonymous with us dominating games for years. Um, if they can't handle it, and, and the, the opposition managers like Gerard, etc., they couldn't handle it either. So they just done away with it. I mean, I was at that game last year. What was it? The second of February, third of February last year, when it was when it was it was the chance to go ahead of them. It was Andrew's game. It was sixty thousand Celtic fans. It was a magical experience. It was unlike it. You know, pa- yeah, paradise under the lights. Hatati masterclass. Um, 
it'll be it'll be good. To, I, I mean, for me, in terms of the ticketing experience, I want the original allocations to be get brought back on both sides because I don't think there's anything better than winning a game and seeing their fans walk out the stadium. There's nothing better for me. It's it's rivalry. The, the rivalry is so important. It's the lifeblood of, of of the Scottish league. You would say. So not having that and not having it, not having it to to gloat at the fans and shout and scream and whatever, it's I think it takes away from that a wee bit. Yes, it does give you those special moments where it's only Celtic fans, and yes, you can pile on the pressure to the Rangers players. But having those fans there and having them absolutely beeling when you're when you're cuffing them is unlike anything else. So I think I think they need to grow up and just accept that. They need to bring the derby back to what it was four or five years ago, and it's up to them to bridge the gap in terms of the, the quality on the pitch. Because, I, I mean, you you lose something when you take that away from it. You take away the fans. I mean, and the fans are the most important thing. I'm sure their fans want to go to all the games as well. So, totally. I think they need. I think maybe not kiss, but they need to make up um, <laughs> and and just get that sorted. I would say. I know people like having the sixty thousand, but I would much rather have have that sort of rivalry brought back in the stadium. We can bully them off the pitch. We can bully them on the pitch. That's what I want. <laughs> that's it, man. I've well, two fronts. That's it. Well, I, I'm with you because, like, we, the, the Celtic Rangers always gets compared against all the other big derbies in world football because it is mm-hmm. the biggest derby in world football, I think, quite comfortably, in my opinion. Absolutely. Most other people listening to this, no doubt. And part of, the, part of that is the in-stadium stuff. Like, see, if you look at all the big ones in South America, or basically every South American country, it's home fans only because the trouble they get is like crazy, you know, like they've got guns and all sorts of stuff over there. So it's like, <laughs> you know, home fans only. But that's not that's not this derby, you know. It's, and, you know, it's, some Celtic fans might want to be a bit um, uh, pedantic over the derby status, how old it is, and you know, some different bits and bobs around that. But, you know, that to one side, you know, this has always been about, you know, like a war, sides versus sides, you know. And when you've only got one set of fans there, it is, you know, you lose a side out of that element. And that's part of what makes it, or what made it, what it was, you know, for me. I mean, for it, sure. And the thing is, they've shot themselves in the foot with regards to this because this is a must win game for them. I would argue that the game they played beforehand in the league, Ibrox, was a must win game for them, which they drew. Um, let's say about that for them, the better, probably. This is a must, must win. And they have none of their fans there to support them and egg them on it's all Celtic fans all the pressure's on them they need to stop us so it's looking it's looking as if they're coming into a lion's den regardless of what Stephen Gerrard would have probably said four or five years ago um, but yeah the, all the pressure's on them and I can only see it going one way at this moment I'm confident I've, I can't not be confident I've, I just watched the way we play um, and I'm, I'm feeling good about our chances yeah, likewise. Rangers will play their game on April Fool's Day uh, this weekend, um, and then we'll be playing on the Sunday. Yeah, so they, they, they like that. <laughs> they, like, they like pretending they've closed the gap for 12 hours, get excited, mm-hmm. and then watch us play the next day. So, um, yeah, it'll be very interesting. And as well, especially, like, if we do rock into that Ross County game with, like, a relatively changed team, like, if Iwata was to start, if Haksabanovic got a start, because we've not even really spoke about the forwards. I think Jota and Kyogo will be nailed on but Maeda does have a bang and a knock. Abada does have a bang and a knock. <coughs> Max Ivanovic, I know he's played minutes, like I mentioned, but he's fit and ready to go. And I know he didn't take maybe the last chance he had in the team, but like you were saying about Turnbull, over the course when he's been coming off the bench and getting onto the pitch, Max Ivanovic has been effective, you know. Um, so, you know, if we started Max Ivanovic and Iwata in that game, for example, and maybe even... It's probably not going to be Rousen, but even if it was like a Rousen or a Burnaby, maybe even another random change in defence that we've not spoke about, we made like three material changes to the 11, went away to Ross County and battered them four or five. Mm. And Rangers were coming into that game and they're like, Jesus, man, this squad is like 20 people. Who are they going to pick? <laughs> you know, like, yeah. um, so I think, you know, there's a wee bit, of, wee bit of early psychology maybe going out from, from our end, you know, in terms of, you know, how strong and how competent we are. Yeah, so absolutely. I'm I'd be wanting us to play Haxabanovich against Ross County at the weekend. I think we need someone that can unlock defences down that side because they'll be tight. They'll they'll want to defend behind the ball. And you've got you've got to remember as well, Ross County are fighting for their lives. This will be a free hit for them at the same time. But they'll be wanting to get something as they go into the split because they'll be playing all the teams in and around them for the last five, six games of the season. So I want a guy like Haxabanovic to be in there that can much like Jota that can unlock a defence, can do some tricks and, and has got goals in his game. I know Maeda's got goals in his game, but there's only certain games I think he really fits. Um, he, I think he fits having more space. But 
Haksabanovic for me. I think he'd be he'd be starting most games for me. I think he's just he has the the sort of joker card in the team. I would say he's the sort of guy that he can make things happen. He's he's not as fast as maybe Jota or Maeda or Avada are, but he's got the skills. He, he reminds me quite a bit about what El Yunusi was in Lennon's first season. That that guy. That yeah, he, yeah. He, he's one paced, but he, he's got the skill and the ability to make things happen, both assists and goal wise. I'm I'm a big Haksabanovic fan. I really want to see him do well. Yeah, no, I agree. And like when Haksabanovic first came out and you know, first kind of broke into the team. My first kind of perception of him, I thought this guy was going to, I thought he, was, he still can, I thought he was going to become Jota level for us, if you know what I mean, in terms yeah. of like how important it would be to win the matches. He's still got that in him, but he's just not had the chance yet, unfortunately. So I'd love to see him get a start. I'd love to see him really influence a match and really run the show and show what he can do. Because even when we're looking at that forward line and we're talking about two to a position, two to a man, like they're all quality choices, you know. Even James Forrest comes in at number seven. You know, he's the seventh wheel on, on, on these front three spaces, you know. So. So it's, it's, it's just, the strength and quality is incredible. Mm-hmm. That's the thing. I think we Haksabanovic, I think a lot of Celtic fans were really, really excited because on his debut, there was a certain trick. That I'm not sure what away ground it was at. I think it was at McDermott Park. He'd done this outrageous bit of skill to sort of run down the line. It was like, this guy is going to cause, cause absolute havoc in this league. I think it's all due to timing with him because the World Cup came at the wrong time for him. He got that injury shortly after picking up the player of the month. And this is him just now coming back into the team. But what is amazing for him, him is that he's still making an impact in these 10 minutes coming off the bench. You look at the two goals against good teams and Hearts and Hibs, I would say, as well. It's not as if he, he's scoring against the, the smaller teams in the league. He's, he's making a difference. He's closing out games. Um, and I, I'm, I'm really, really desperate to see what more he can do. I think he's the sort of guy that we'll see the best of next season. Um, once he's had a full pre-season under his belt, I, th- I think there's definitely more to come. And you forget that he's only 24 as well, so he's still got his best years ahead of him, and hopefully there at Celtic as well. Even Haksabanovic, like we didn't see that much out of him before the club actioned that buy now clause on him. You know, from the loan, they went and signed that off and made it permanent. Whereas other players, obviously, we didn't exercise that option. And when you do see, like you said, the best of him maybe comes next season. And if somebody like Abada did leave, do you even need to replace him? Like, you know, if, no. if this guy does kick on, you know? That's the thing, though. That I, I'm sure that Haksabanovic was a permanent signing. I'm sure we signed him on a five-year deal. Um, yeah, no, we did. That's what I'm saying. We've done I, it. I, 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 absolutely. That's absolutely brilliant. He's, he's one of the players that you probably would expect us to bring in as a sort of loan player to see what he's like before we buy him. I like that we've done that in the Japanese market. Yes, there are obligations to buy, but it's good that we're covering ourselves like that financially as well. With Haksabanovic, it's great that he's settled. He's got the five-year deal He'll be here next season. He'll be, and I think I think we'll see even more next season. We've seen I've seen enough this season to know that this guy can be a star player both in the league and in Europe as well. Having a guy like him in Europe is going to be so important. A guy that can just get you a goal out of nothing. Um, I mean the, the strength of the, the, the power he's got in his shots. It, I think I think we're going to see an absolute screamer very soon from him in terms of like a really really powerful shot. He's been threatening it a couple of times. Yes, he's, he's, his goals have been more finesse, but. I think he's got an absolute thunder shot on him that we're going to see in the next few weeks. And fingers crossed that's against Rangers, especially. Oh. I, I don't, I don't know, I don't know if I could handle that if he'd done that. To be honest, because <laughs> I mean, my my celebrations against Hearts and Hibs, respectively, when he scored were outrageous as it was. He's one of my favourite players. Him and Hatati are my two favourite players in this team. But if he was to do that against Rangers, I've I've got no apologies for what I would do, honestly. <laughs> Normally when I'm at these Rangers, that's the thing as well. He had about three chances in the last five minutes at Hamden, um, but he must be keeping his shooting boots for um, next Saturday, which I'm not complaining about. Yeah, not totally. I was just about to say there as well. Like he's he's one of the league leading. Um, he's leading the league in one of these statistics. Etienne told me on the on, on a show we did on Tuesday. Is so there's CSC. It's like Haksabanovic leads the league and. Key pa- uh, smart passes, which are lane breaking passes, you know. And I know that's a wee bit of a, a minute fit, you know, because he's not had many minutes. So per minute, like the statistics probably skewing his favour slightly. But you know, all the goals he scored. I'm looking back at his record so far: two goals against Dundee United, one goal already against Ross County uh, this season, and then the two against Hearts and Hibs, like you mentioned, uh, sandwiched around that cup game where he started and didn't do anything against Hearts. Mm-hmm. Um, so you know, he's definitely, you know, per minute he's. Abada makes anyone look bad per minute because Abada does something every 10 seconds, it feels like, you know, when you look back at his record. But these numbers are very credible, you know, and 
when I struggle as well, and it's the reason I brought up, uh, not about I struggle, sorry, but it's the reason I brought up earlier that he played midfield for Montenegro because we we're talking earlier on about Turnbull as well and maybe some developments that happen or don't happen in that position of the pitch. Because when I look at the front three, I think Maeda is teacher's pet. Ange's always going to pick him if he's fit and available, basically. Kyogo's the man, we all know that. And Jota's the, the stardust, you know. So if I said similar to Iwata potentially gets into the team and cannot be moved, his midfield's maybe a place where he drops in. And again, that's just more problems, more headaches. <laughs> no, it's headaches, but it's good headaches. You don't need head you don't need medication for these ones because these are these are really, really good headaches to have. The thought of um, I mean, the couple of games that he's played as a number ten or sort of that highest midfielder, he's looked really dangerous and you you see the opposition, especially against Tibbs actually, came on as a number ten. Hibbs looked scared of him when he was running at them because he's just yep. so he's so unorthodox with his dribbling. He's 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 dodgy. He, Hibs won't come across a player like that very often that will run at them like that as a number 10. Um, I, I, it's great that he has that sort of um, flexibility because you, you are right, Maeda is Andrew's pet. And I've always said this, I've said this on my own podcast, that Maeda is the human embodiment of Ange Ball. If, if Ange Ball was a person, it would be Dyson Maeda. He's yeah. just... I, th- I think he was brought up like this. It wouldn't surprise me if down the line, like, Angie's his dad or something that he's always <laughs> lived with us. Um, he's just, uh, he, he just does everything that Ange wants him to do. And I remember there was a lot of stick earlier on the seasons, particularly after the Sparta, Sparta no, um, Shakhtar Donetsk game at home. Uh, he had an absolute stinker and people were like, like, it's not working out for Maeda. But, Ever since then, I don't think he's looked back. I think he's came back from the World Cup with so much confidence, and he, he deserves to be in the team. It's not as if he's he's just an he's just an Ange pet, Ange teacher's pet. He deserves to be in the team now. His numbers are great, and he's he's on there on merit now. But if there's a way to incorporate both into the team, both Haxa and Maeda, then I'm all for it. But it, it you're right, it does give you more um, headaches in terms of the midfield. We're absolutely stacked in midfield. It's incredible. But long may it continue. Yeah, for sure. Because uh, Ange Ball, it all ticks around that midfield and then, you know, inverted fullback like we see Taylor do, like, owns that position to a T, you know. So, it's, uh, you know, the midfield, it feels so crucial. But, again, what's so crucial about the midfield with Fatate and all these guys in the Ange Ball system is only, it's only made possible by the efforts of the forward line of the Maedas and the Kyogos going forward and, and causing havoc and creating space for the guys to operate in. So, yeah, no, it's, it's definitely headaches you don't need medication for. I love that. It's a great way of putting it. And uh, yeah, for sure, long may it continue. So I, I think, Brian, that pretty much brings us to the point. We're looking ahead at Ross County. We've kind of bumbled around, I guess, what maybe could be perceived as a predicted 11. I don't know if we've quite maybe nailed one out there. I think Joe Hart goes without saying has been in goals. At right back, do we think Johnson will make it? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, no problem at all. And, and I think the biggest compliment that I can give to Johnson now Nobody's questioning who's playing at right back anymore. And that was the case with Juranovic. It's got to be said that the first half of this season, people were like, I would much rather prefer Ralston. There was actually there was people saying that. Now nobody's saying that, which which is a shame for Ralston because Ralston's a good deputy to have. But Johnson, I think Johnson's an upgrade. And you look yeah. at the age profile, you look at how he fits in this team. His best games have both been against Rangers, which is incredible. And it seems as if he's getting better and better every single game. There's so much upside with Johnson, and I think he's only going to get better. It's an it's another tremendous find from the scouting team. This scouting team doesn't get enough credit, in my opinion, because you look at our hit rate just now, it must be in like the high 80s, early 90s in terms of percentage of how many success stories we've had over the past two years. It's incredible. No, big time. I, I make you totally right on all that. I would pro- I, personally, but I do think it's a little bit closer between Ralston and Juranovic, um, mm. uh, Johnson, sorry, I beg your pardon. I think a lot big, but yeah, I, I think from the fans' perspective, 100% it is only Johnson nowadays that anyone's talking about. But um, I don't know. I, I've I, I don't know. I, I've got a wee bit of hope for Ralston that you know mm-hmm. he'll, he'll he'll get he'll, he'll maybe get a wee shot. He's been first team for a while, but that's the thing. He'll get games. Name. He will get games because the two need to rotate. And I think from where Ralston was at the start of last season to where he is now, he'll be delighted with the way things have went over the past 18, 20 months. So. Again, he'll just need to bide his time again, and then once he gets his opportunity, he needs to take it. But it's it, it's it's a great position to have. It, we're in a great position where right back is one of our strongest positions because in years gone by, that was one of our weakest positions. So I'm I'm, I'm delighted with where we're at with regards to that. 
Yeah, it's good to have two good ones for sure. Um, Centre back, Carter Vickers, obviously good to go and ready to rock. Uh, just had to double check. Starfield did go away with Sweden, didn't make it off the bench. Um, and if memory serves, did he, was there maybe a wee injury concern about him before the international break? Obviously, that'll be gone now, but. I, there was, but remember, remember he, he came off with a slight knock against Hearts, but he played against Hibs. So. That's what it was. Yeah, but the, but we've got another capable deputy in the back there with Kobayashi as well. Really, really excited to see how he gets on because I, I have heard mumblings that he's been phenomenal in training as well. He is, he's the next one coming through as well. So that's very, very exciting. His age profile is brilliant. What twenty one years old? It's good that he's hanging about with Kyogo as well. Kyogo's making him feel at home. Obviously, they were teammates at Viso Kobe. So. I'm looking forward to that. I'm looking forward to seeing him getting more of a chance next season or even at the end of this season if we get the league wrapped up, we can sort of rotate a wee bit more. Yeah, big time. Uh, probably Carter Vickers and Starfield. I'd love to see you yeah. get the minutes. You know, who knows? Since, I think you know, sometimes we've seen this. Vickers. Yeah, I think so too. But we've seen this sometimes with international windows where maybe like the manager has given minutes to the guys that have been at home training the whole time and preparing mm -hmm. for that match for two weeks. So it's definitely one to keep your eye on. But I think, yeah, probably will be Starfield. And then it has to be Taylor in at left back, eh? Mm -hmm. He's fit as a fiddle and ready to rock. Midfield, we're probably agreed on McGregor and we probably agree on O'Reilly. And then through mm -hmm. chatting through the podcast, we're both probably going to go with the curveball of Iwata to maybe come in. And yeah, get he, can play the number six. he can play the number six. McGregor can play a wee bit further forward and then O'Reilly. I think there's a nice yeah. balance to that midfield. But that's caveated by the fact that if Hitati's fit, he'll play. He's got to like play him. if he's fit. I mean... I remember there was one game a couple of weeks ago where Hatati was on the bench. I'm like, I think it was the cup game actually. Was it a cup game against St Mirren that he was on the bench? Yeah. Um, and we were like, you could see the difference when Hatati's not on the pitch. So if we have somebody like Iwata that can come on and maybe do some of the things that Hatati can do, that would be great. It would really sort of soften the blow of not having Hatati. But if Hatati's fit, he plays. Yeah, big time. And then front three, Jota. We're both on that, aren't we? Absolutely. Yeah, Kyogo all day, every day. And he's yep. he Kyogo's getting three or four goals. Not getting picked for the Japan national team. He's making documentaries about it and he is out to to prove the doubters wrong. So I see uh, Kyogo definitely smashing out three or four goals this weekend. But mm -hmm. the final the final attacker spot, Ryan, is probably the one Haxabanovic, Forrest, Abada, Maeda. Who would you go for? It's gotta be Haxa for me. This is the Haxa fan club. Both Ryan, both the other Ryan and I are on the Haxabanovic um Trail. I don't know if we're getting paid for it. Um, if, if anyone wants to pay for it, that'd be great. But Hax is our guy. We we just want him to be playing. He's the he can unlock things. He can make things happen. Um, and and just going back to Kyogo, just quickly, seeing him not get picked for the Japan side was really really difficult to watch that video. I don't know about you, but it was really really quite emotional. I don't like seeing him sad because I'm so used to seeing him with a big smile on his face. So watching him absolutely gutted. But then he was smiling a couple of hours later when he was inviting the people into his car. Um, it just shows you he doesn't let anything get him down. And I think for the two Japanese boys especially that didn't get picked, and Hitati and Hyogo, they've came back like a house on fire. They've they've really taken it sort of like Michael Michael Jordan. They've taken it, they've took it personally and they've taken it out on everyone else in the league. And that's that's been a positive for us as well because we've seen the best of them. Um, I think it's baffling that they don't get in the Japan team, but that's. I guess that's the, the the manager's decision over there, but I think they're both tremendous players that would really help the Japan team. Yeah, I agree, uh, particularly with Kyogo. Uh, I definitely real the way he's going now as well. And yeah, no, you're quite right. I'm making a bit of light from it, but when I've seen that bit where you see the bit in the documentary where he sees the announcement, he says up to half five in the morning for it, he wakes up at half five in the morning for it, it hits you in the feels, you know? But like when you see, that for me, honestly, like... um. You know, I found it quite uplifting, if nothing else. Um, but when you see him in the car afterwards, and he's like, you know, only focus on what I can do. I'm only going to focus on me. You can only, yeah, it is what it is. That's his choice. You can only move, you can only do what you're doing. It's such an admirable admirable quality. Um, and, you know, that, fair enough, that's what he's putting out there. Who knows how he really feels internally. But even still, you know, that that mindset is it, it's what separates him, I think. You know, what you, you get that person through the pitch when you see him celebrating with the fans and whatever. So, yeah, I'm I'm backing him for three or four at the weekend. Um, mm -hmm. I think he'll absolutely go and kill Ross County in uh, the honour of his caps he's not got. <laughs> yeah, he could, you could easily go and see him. You could see him scoring three or four goals. I don't... 
for me, just look, talking about the whole striker situation, has there been a better relationship between fans and supporters, maybe other than Dembele, than Kyogo and the Celtic fans since Larson? I, I honestly can't think. There's that sort of love between the two. Um, it's just... It, 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 it's, no. it's so connected. It's, it's absolutely brilliant. Um, this, this guy that just came out of absolutely nowhere that get that get announced at what six seven in the morning that that July day or June or July day whatever it was. Little did we know how much of an impact he would have on everything over the past two years. Um, I, I, you could actually get emotional talking about Kyogo because it just means that much to the, the the fans and the team, and he's he's just an absolute joy and long may he continue doing that. I hope he doesn't move anywhere. I hope we're, we've got him at that age where he's not going to move anywhere now that he's 28. He wants to stay until he's 42, 33. That would be ideal for me. Yeah, no, I'm I, same. I'm, I'm a few other way on that. And like, um, I, I was saying to Declan after you came on, you came on one time with Declan when I couldn't be here and uh, you were saying, oh, I can't remember who you was, but you're liking someone to, to Maravchik. I can't remember who it was. Or I can't remember, was it Hitati? It would have um, been, yeah. But uh, I, you know, for me, like I, I put a tweet out not long ago after Kyogo was killing it for us against somebody. I'm like, just get dreadlocks on this guy now, you know. Like for me, <laughs> like Kyogo is like this generation's Larson, if you know what I mean. He is that world class, and I know Jaws like potentially going to be uh, have a great career and all the rest of it. But for me, Kyogo's Kyogo's the man. You know, he is the Celtic man. Mm. You know, in that sense where, like you say, the fans champion him. He's the you know everyone agrees he's the main guy and. I say really embodies like the good spirit in the team and the the culture he's, around the place. And much like Larson, I think he's the player that opposition players are scared of. They should yeah. be because he's he's the he's the baby faced assassin. I would say in our team, he's the guy. He'll kill you, but he'll kill you with a smile on his face. Um, and it's an absolute joy to watch him. And other teams should be scared of him because I think there's levels between him and the other strikers in the league. With that, but when you said that at first, in terms of the fan connection with strikers, I'm, you know, I'm sitting here rolling back my memories and trying to think about, yeah, beyond Edward and Dembele, we were so barren for like a talismanic striker for ages, like really, you know, and a lot of the names I could throw out there, I'm thinking of are memes now at this point, you know, like maybe, um, maybe Hooper, Hooper was one as well, but Hooper. that was that was probably tarred a wee bit by the fact that he left to go to England at the first opportunity, which didn't really work out for him when you look at it. Norwich was a bit of a weird move for him. I know he wanted to play for the England team. That never transpired, but um, Hooper was loved. Stokes maybe to a lesser extent, obviously with the Irish links as well. But um, I, Kyogo, there just seems to be this synergy between the fans and the player. There's this, there's this love, the fact that he starts with the celebrations. He's his nice messages on Instagram and 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 the TikTok, even the TikToks that he does in the Celtic page, it's it's absolutely brilliant. I think I think there's that this generation that are just coming through of of all the children watching him, they all look up to Kyogo. Kyogo's their guy, and it's great that they've got somebody like we did with Larson and Hooper and Edward and Dembele, etc. Yeah, I'm totally with you on that. It gives me the feels even thinking about that, you know, because when you're yeah. a wee guy supporting Celtic, it's that's that that's Superman. You know, it's the mm. biggest thing in your world, isn't it? Was Larson or Kyogo? But you know, I would, I would also say as well, and I do want to mention him. I know, he, I know his goal was offside and his qualifiers, but I think O's going to be a really good player for us as well. You can see why Ange has been scouting him for what six, seven months. That was before he even had that goal scoring run. It's mental to think that we were scouting him, and then he had the the, the run that kept uh, the Blue Wings up. But he, his profile is really, really. I mean, I was watch. I watched the clips of him playing for South Korea. There, he's looking as if he's grown into a hell of a player already. Um, and he'll be he'll be great foil for Kyogo. That's another thing. I think Kyogo could play a number ten, and O could play up front. That that could happen with Kyogo's movement. Maybe we could do that against lesser Indeed. teams in the league. Um, but I'm really really excited to see what O can do in this team. Um, I think he's he's got so much upside. Twenty one can score goals. Um, he's got his best years ahead of him, but. Kyogo's the main man, and I don't think anyone can dispute that. Aye, I'm a few other way. I think I've talked myself into a score prediction of like 6-0. What are you going to go for, Ryan? <laughs> I think I'm going to go for about, about 16 now after what we're talking about. <laughs> um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go for 5-0. Come on, round number like 5. Um, aye, 5-0. Kyogo Hattrick, you've, you've talked me into it. I think he's, I think he's going to run run wild. He's, he's, been, he's been training... Um, he's not went away with Japan. That suits us. 
Um, give me Kyogo with three, Haxa with one, and Jota with the other. Give me the whole front three scoring. That's it. If you're still listening to this, let's hear your score predictions in the comment section down below. And if you want to add on goal scorers as well, love to see it. Hope you've enjoyed this one. Have fun this weekend. And hail, hail. Ryan, thanks a lot, mate. Thank you, mate. Cheers.